Hello and welcome to the second lecture on brand naming. In this lecture, you will learn the types of names and how they are created. To begin with, I'd like to say that there are different ways of classifying names. We will organize them into two approaches, semantic and cons construct. Within the semantic approach, we will analyze the descriptive, abstract, and suggestive brand names and the naming construct approach will provide insights into the names that are real word, compound, and coined. So this is the agenda of the lecture. Let's get started. The semantic approach is about the semantic relationship between a name and an underlying brand. How the meaning of a name connects to the company, product, or service. As figure 2.1 on the slide demonstrates, the semantic approach can range from descriptive names, which tell it exactly as it is, such as the container store or vitamin water, to abstract names, which have no relevant meaning, like Virgin, Everlane, or Desani. Many brand names are suggestive, falling somewhere between descriptive and abstract. They imply or hint at something about the underlying brand without coming out and saying it directly. For example, Twitter, Google, or JetBlue. Often, the degree to which a suggestive name leads towards the descriptive or abstract end of the spectrum is debatable. Now, let's take a closer look at descriptive, abstract, and suggestive names with some more examples. Descriptive names clearly convey tangible information about the brands to which they refer. For example, the container store is indeed a store that sells containers. Vitamin water really does contain vitamins, although sugar water would be even more descriptive in this case. The primary benefit of descriptive names is obvious. They require little or no explanation. Theoretically, less explanation means fewer resources expended clarifying what the company does or what the product is. On the other hand, descriptive names, such as demonstrated here on the slide, are less flexible and can pigeonhole a company that has outgrown its initial business model. Just look at Pizza Hut, which tried to rebrand as just the hut in its effort to highlight non-pizza offerings, such as wings or pasta, but the rebranding has failed. Another example is Radio Shack. It attempted to become just the shack and was no less doomed. Descriptive names are also typically less distinctive and harder to protect. Apple can stop another consumer electronic manufacturer from naming their company Apple, but they can't stop that company from using the word watch in the name of their Apple Watch knockoff. For these reasons, many professional namers advise against the descriptive approach at a company name level. Moreover, a lot of people simply consider these names dull. For example, Recent article in Forbes titled Five Pitfalls to Avoid in Naming Your Business as Thirds, while it may seem logical to give your business a name that describes exactly what it is, in doing so, you are likely to wind up with something generic and honestly forgettable. But descriptive names can work well for products, services, and features, keeping this Spotlight trained on more valuable brands, as evidenced by Apple Watch. It puts all the emphasis on the big brand, Apple. And even when naming a company, don't be so quick to write off the descriptive approach. Some descriptive names stand out via double entendre, such as the boring company, which bores holes or 
It may be surprising language, such as big ass fans, which makes guess what? Big as ceiling fans. Two special subcategories of descriptive names often are used as company names. In fact, go back far enough and seemingly all companies took one or two literal approaches to naming. They adopted the name of their place of origin or their founder's name. Some of the oldest brands still around today have founders' names, such as Ford, founded by Henry Ford, or Twinnings Tea, founded by Thomas Twinning. Many world-famous brands follow this pattern, including McDonald's, Disney, and Louis Vuitton. And the use of the founders' names is still pervasive today in banking, law, and other traditional industries. Other companies use geographic names highlighting the country, city, or region in which they got their start. Founded near the Hudson Bay in Canada, Hudson's Bay Company now owns Saks Fifth Avenue, which is named for both its founder and the location of its flagship store. Other well-known brands with geographic names include Bank of Taiwan, and the New York Life. Many small local businesses continue to use this descriptive approach today. Now to abstract names. Well, truly abstract names don't even hint at what the brand is or does. Without additional context, no one could have guessed Starbucks sold coffee or Uber sold car rides. Abstract names may manage to convey some intangible quality, like a brand's personality, but they are untethered from any practical description of the underlying company or product. Look at these abstract names exemplified in figure 2.3. They're often easier to protect from a legal standpoint. They are also infinitely flexible, as evidenced by the fact a company that goes by Virgin can use that name successfully not only for music, but across everything, from banking to commercial space flight. On the downside, however, abstract names require more explanation due to their lack of inherent meaning, and therefore, may take more time, effort, and money to build a brand around. Bear in mind that abstract describes a semantic approach, but is agnostic with respect to construct. In other words, abstract names can be real words like virgin, or made-up words like Viagra. Real word abstract names are also known as arbitrary. What the United States Patent and Trademark Office describes as actual words with a known meaning that have no association or relationship with the goods protected. Invented abstract names are often called fanciful or empty vessel names. They are invented words with no definition, allowing the brand owner to pour meaning into them. And that's really interesting. Suggestive names are also known as evocative or associative. They give clues as to what the brand is all about. Some examples are presented in figure 2.4. As we can see, some suggestive names give more obvious clues, such as iPhone, for example. It doesn't really mean anything, but clearly has something to do with phones. The I letter, which originated first in iMac and similar product names preceding iPhone by almost a decade, was originally meant to convey internet. Suggestive names that fall towards the descriptive end of the spectrum are sometimes called enhanced descriptive. On the other hand, 
but still in the suggestive range, are names such as Twitter, which according to co-founder and CEO Jack Dorsey, means a short burst of inconsequential information. Despite Dorsey's admission that that's exactly what the product was, um, it's hardly a descriptive name. Without a lengthy explanation, no one could have guessed what a company or product named Twitter did. The project's working name was Status at first, and it could have been far more descriptive, as the software allows users to share their personal status updates. Well, some brand names are described as metaphorical. By definition, metaphors are suggestive. They suggest the similarity or relationship in a non-literal way. Therefore, metaphorical names are a good subcategory of suggestive names. Most metaphors rely on real words. Amazon, for example, is a good metaphor for something massive, which was Jeff Bezos' vision of his online retailer. But compound and coined names can also contain metaphors. Perhaps because it captures such a wide range of names, the suggestive category is the most popular kind of brand name. This is according to Catchword, a leading naming agency in Oakland, California. Suggestive names are also popular because they represent a compromise. They capture some benefits and avoid some drawbacks of the two extremes, descriptive and abstract. And now let's turn to the naming construct approach. Naming construct is about structure, including whether a name is built from one or more real words, invented words, or parts of words, meshed up to form something new. While semantic approach is best conceptualized as a smooth continuum from descriptive to abstract, construct on the other hand, is typically conceived of as three discrete groups. We have real word names, compound names, and coined names. And beyond these three groups, however, construct can also capture factors such as language. For example, we can have some Latin words, abbreviation, use of numbers, symbols, and names use of capitalization and the length of names. Let's consider these groups in detail. First, real word names. They are made up of one or more real correctly spelled words. For example, the US food bank nonprofit Feeding America has a real word name that more or less says what it is, that is, a descriptive or enhanced descriptive name. Quartz, the news organization, has a real word abstract name because a crystalline mineral has nothing to do with business news. Real word names exemplified here in figure 2.5 are more likely to be spelled and pronounced correctly and have built-in meaning, for speakers of that language at least. Real, word, uh, real words also can have connotations and associations. And that can cut both ways. Positive connotations can redound to the brand's benefits, while negative ones can torpedo an otherwise strong name candidate. Real word names are also harder to acquire. If not from a legal standpoint, at least from the view of digital real estate like web domains or social media handles. And that may be a problem. Then compound names. Let's have a look at figure 2.6. Compound names illustrated here are really appealing because they allow namers to squeeze multiple ideas into a single name somewhat easily. Consider the names Zipcar or Fitbit, for instance. Zip 
suggests something fast and easy, where a car describes a product. Fit speaks to exercise and health. And bit hints at something small and digital. Compared to real words, compound names can also be hard to acquire. It's easy to lay claim to such names in terms of trademarks and web domains. Mm, because of their ubiquity, compounds are sometimes said to feel like brand names, really feel like brand names. And while this familiar feeling may provide some comfort, when launching a new brand into the world, it can also result in a name feeling trendy or dated. Let's take camel case. In particular, camel is associated with late 90s or early 2000s, when companies like Alta Vista and GeoCities reigned supreme. In the words of Amanda Peterson, former head of naming at Google, there is no reason to use camel case. I think it's a crime against linguistics, personally. Then we have coin names. Coin names include any that are made up of or contain any newly invented words. Sometimes referred to as invented names, fabricated names, or neologisms, this category includes all the following constructs arranged loosely from lightly coined to whole cloth coinages. Here we talk about misspelling or cacography. Let's take, for example, flicker, root, loops, lift. Secondly, we have portmando or blended names. Well, let's take accenture. It's a blend, accent plus future. Or Groupon. We have here a blend. Group plus coupon. And of course, our favorite Pinterest, which is pin plus interest. Third pattern includes prefixation or suffixation. Let's take, for example, Instacart or Leafly or our favorite Spotify. Then we may have truncation or deconstruction. The name Cisco originates from San Francisco. Also, the name Lidus comes from Kaleidoscope. Along with this, we may borrow from different languages, mostly from Greek or Latin roots. For example, we have such names as Agilent, Diageo, Pentium. And finally, we may take empty vessel or fanciful name, just invented, like we have Axon, Kodak, or Desani. They are fully fanciful. Generally speaking, coined names have the advantage of being more available. They may be easier to trademark and protect, and that and that domains and social media handles may be easier to obtain. But they are likely to be harder to spell, pronounce, and of course remember. Coined names can work well for entirely new concepts for which no suitable word really exists. But a name without any building meaning, an empty vessel like Kodak or Desani, may require more resources to educate target audience and familiarize them with a name. Let's take another look at the diagram in figure 2.8 with some more names, types, and synonymous plotted here. As you can see in the diagram, the two-dimensional semantic approach and construct approach allow a deeper understanding of how different types of brand names relate to one another. Coined and abstract are not two distinct name types, as the oversimplified one-dimensional formulation might lead you to believe. Rather, 
a single name can classify as both coined and abstract. In this case, again, I refer to Kodak, for example. Kodak is coined and Kodak is abstract at the same time. So a combination referred to as fanciful or empty vessel. That said, while this system captures the vast majority of brand names, it fails to perfectly catch every brand name and brand type. So some names are harder to classify. They don't fall squarely into any of our three primary naming constructs or three types within the semantic approach. They are debatable rather than, I guess, um, force fitting them into our semantic approach or construct diagram, um, it often best to simply view them as outliers. And um, here, let's begin with the abbreviations. If you're looking uh, forward to show off your naming knowledge and annoy your friends and colleagues in this, explain the difference between acronyms and initialisms. Well, acronyms are read and pronounced as words. For example, NASR. Initialisms are pronounced letter by letter. We say IBM. Furthermore, some acrony acronyms referred to as amalgams are formed from the first few letters of each word of a longer name, such as Nabisco, which is short for National Biscuit Company. Initialisms, on the other hand, use only the first letters, that is, the initial letters, of each word in the longer name. Rounding out the abbreviated uh, name type are alphanumerics, distinguished by the combination of letters and numerals, and purely numerics, names and identifiers consisting of numerals only. Alphanumerics and numerics are often used to distinguish between products in large, complex portfolios. Let's take Lexus. It does with the cars like the UX210, LC500H, or let's take the company Boeing with its 747 and 737 airplanes. But standalone products can also have alphanumeric names like WD-40 or um, so can entire uh, companies like uh, 37 Signals, the original name of the organization behind the web-based project management tool. To continue, uh, to understand why abbreviated names are sometimes hard to classify. Let's look at a well-known company with its alphanumeric name, 3M. 3M is not a real word. Arguably, it's not a coined word either, because um, it's not a word at all, in fact. That makes the naming construct hard to pin down, unless we create a new category for abbreviations, I guess. Uh, the semantic approach is not much easier. Uh, here, 3M could be considered descriptive because it's short for Minnesota Mining and Manufacturing Company. But many consumers of 3M products like scotch tape or post-in notes uh, have no idea what those 3Ms stand for. <laughs> so it's likely perceived as an abstract name. The same is true of many abbreviated names. Just think, if you'd never known what NASA or IBM stood for, they'd be just as meaningless to you as uh, Axon or something else. Well, um, the lack of inherent meaning is exactly why, generally speaking, these abbreviated constructs are frowned upon by professional namers, especially for company names. Um, failing to convey any meaning on their own, they are like codes that customers must decipher, but no one wants it. Furthermore, they are often bland, 
lacking in personality and challenging from spelling or pronunciation standpoint. And that may be problematic. Uh, well, another point uh, worthy of discussion is foreign languages naming. Uh, here in naming real word only applies to words from the primary language of the brand and its target audience. Let's take the word Qingtao. It's the name of a Chinese beer sold all over the world. It might be considered foreign in the UK, but in China, it's simply a beer named after its place of origin. Well, words from one language are every bit real as those from another, the, is, uh, the distinction is important in naming because of how foreign words are perceived. And as with abbreviations, their perception depends heavily on the knowledge of the audience. Some foreign language names are suggestive. Using a language to convey attributes of the country in which it's spoken. Let's take Prego, for example. Prego is a US born brand of tomato sauce. But it sounds Italian to Americans. In other names, foreign words serve as empty vessels, chosen for how they sound or what they mean, even if there is very little chance their customers will pick up on that meaning. Another example is Hulu. Hulu was chosen partly because it's not a real word in the English language and thus has no dictionary definition or immediate meaning in the brand's primary market. This is according to the company's CEO. Also, Hulu means both good and interactive recording in Chinese. In such a way, as we can see, Prego and Hulu are real words in Italian and Chinese, respectively, but lumping them with real word names like Meatball Shop or Peacock will fail to capture his unique name type. Well, adding yet another wrinkle, <laughs> some brands use foreign sounding names without using real foreign words. Let's take the example Boku. Boku, the name of the mobile payment platform, is an international misspelling of Boku, French for very much. And then there is Hagen Das. To many in the United States and around the world, it looks and sounds like a vaguely Danish name. But Danish writing doesn't use umlauts or the letter combination ZS. In fact, the name is nonsense. It was invented. It was invented in Manhattan by the Polish-American founder, Ruben Mattis. In fact, he sat at his kitchen table and tried out different combinations of meaningless words until he finally heard something he liked. That was how it works. Well, and um, in addition to differing uh, based on semantics and construction, brand names can vary in their tonality. Tonality is the feeling a name evokes. For example, Logix and DocuCollab. They are two contract management software companies. They both have enhanced the descriptive coined names, but Logix is far more playful, while DocuCollab seems to take itself more seriously. Tonality is related to brand's personality, a set of human personality traits ascribed to a brand. Often, a personality is formally articulated as a part of company or product's brand strategy. Let's say T-Mobile is fun, daring, genuine, and cool. Mozilla is gutsy, independent, open-minded, and for good. Lyft is more cheerful than Uber. Uh, well, 
This is the analysis according to people who use these products. When the brand personality hasn't been officially documented, it can usually be determined through a handful of interviews or series of simple exercises. Regardless, namers need a general sense of the current or designed brand personality to ensure that it's reflected in the tonality of recommended name ideas. Or at the very least, that the tonality of the brand name does not clearly contradict the brand's personality. But what is it about the examples about logics and DocuCollab? Uh, what is it that makes them feel fun and serious, respectively? In fact, tonality is delivered through a combination of meaning, structure, and sound. Uh, if we look at their meaning, we may say that when brand names contain real words or recognizable parts of words, the definitions and connotations of those words can influence tonality. For example, a name that contains hyper, for example, might be uh, interpreted as powerful, energetic, or intense, at least by speakers of English and any other languages in which, in which hyper conveys a similar meaning, like Greek, from which English borrows this prefix. Looking at the structure, we may say that short names might feel cute or clever, while longer names could feel heavy and important. Wordplay like rhyming and alliteration can make names feel more playful or whimsical, in addition to make them, making them more memorable. Structure can impact tonality in many ways, but may more often act as a false multiplier on tonality conveyed through other attributes of the name. Finally, let's consider sound. Uh, well, sound symbolism, or if we may say so, phonosemantics, is the theory that speech sounds have meaning. Onomatopoeia is one example of sound symbolism. Words like whoosh imitate real word sound. But also individual letters and clusters of letters can have great impact. They may affect tonality in many ways. For example, many English words that begin with the combination of letters s, l have something s l have something to do with water or moisture. Look at these words: slick, slime, slippery, slurp, slobber, slush, slurry, slake, just to name the few. Um, as a result, names that begin with Sl sound combination uh, with real or coined words may come across as sleek, smooth, or thirst quenching. Interestingly, because of sound symbolism, even an empty vessel name can have a tonality, despite its lack of inherent meaning. You could argue, in fact, that empty vessel names trade on tonality alone. In classic psychology study, participants were shown two shapes, one angular and one rounded, and were asked to ma match them with the names like Kiki and Booba. You can try this experiment yourself. Which of the shapes in figure 2.9 would you guess goes with Kiki and which with Booba? Right? Well, if you call the jagged looking shape Kiki and the curvy shape Booba, your answers match those of the vast majority of respondents in these studies. You know, hard consonants like K and T, along with bright vowels, such as A sound or E sound, are associated with harder edges and sharper corners. Soft sounds like m or l and rounded vowels or and u 
lend themselves to smoother curvier forms. Just as George Eastman liked Kodak for its powerful K sounds, Phil Knight was drawn to the strong K sound in Kike. He was not immediately a fan of the name, however, and perhaps the soft O and E of the name Ole, a meaningful coined name, contributed to its success as a beauty cream offering women softer, smoother skin. Thank you very much for your attention. So far, you have explored approaches to classifying brand names, semantic and const construct. You've seen the features of descriptive, abstract, and suggestive names. You've looked at the name structure, real words, compounds, and coin names. And you have explored tonality and naming. For further reading, I recommend a best-selling book by Rob Mayerson, Brand Naming. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask them in the comments below. Like this video to see more content like this.